everyone. Welcome back to the quest for the bestest brought to you by Backlog Banter. It's the podcast where us Backlog boys try to figure out what the very best best picture winner of all time is. And we go about that by watching them all through in random order. Our life is dictated by the spin wheel. And don't worry, the spin wheel will make its uh, eventual appearance in this episode. But this week, we are talking about Mrs. Miniver, directed by William Wyler from 1942. It's a World War II picture. It's a bit of an important World War II picture. And uh, I cannot wait to get into it because I think I think there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about this movie, even though maybe it's a little less on the fun side. But before we get to that, let's revisit what we talked about last week. Uh, well, last week we went even farther back in time, talking about Broadway Melody from 1929, and while it wasn't exactly close to being our lowest film on the, uh, on, on the list, it is the second lowest film at place That's number... pretty f- close. 50. It's just about as close as you can get, uh, mm-hmm. uh, without hitting you straight on the nose. I was talking about <laughs> the numerical average uh, at place number 56. Oh, sure. Broadway Melody got 1.8... Pretty, pretty low scores all around. Uh, it's a short episode, so if you uh, don't have a whole lot of time but you want some good Quest content, I recommend ta- checking it out because, boy, well, we don't actually have a lot to say about that movie. It kind of blowed. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand it off to Tucker, who's got our featured comment, which relates a little bit to Broadway Melody, and then um, we'll get into discussing Mrs. Miniver. Yeah, we have a comment from good John Tour 11. Uh, who comments on not Broadway Wild, Broadway Wild Melody because of ever, as of recording, that episode does not exist for the public yet. Um, but he commented on The Great Ziegfeld for whatever reason. He was just going back and doing it. I appreciate that very much. Uh, so he comments on that video saying, this felt like the longest film ever. It took me half a day to get through it. I have to say, though, that I had some fun time during those musical numbers. A giant cake. <laughs> OTT costumes <laughs> that would make any drag queen jealous. And then they bring in the dogs. It was just hilarious. It was the first time for me seeing Louise Rayner. Her Julie singing was just adorable. I can understand why she was marketed as the new Greta Garbo. She was stu- really was stunningly beautiful. And then the Oscar curse hit. And I was wondering who that woman was who reminded me of Barbara Streisand. Turned it out, it was, it was the real Fanny Bryce that Streisand portrayed in the 60s. But the storytelling here was a mess. It felt like there were were just some random scenes with random actors thrown in there. I was sure the movie would end with a big number with two giant cakes, but no. Overall impression is that this just felt like a cheesy Las Vegas show gone wrong. Four and a half out of ten. Well, Florence Florence Ziegfeld. Yeah, Florence Ziegfeld will be appalled to hear you say that, John Tour 11, but what's he going to do? Pissing in his grave right now. (laughs) For for a little bit of context, we, like, way, way back, early February, talked about Great Ziegfeld. Um, Similar movie to Broadway Melody. We gave it uh, quite a bit better score, a 4.0 out of 10 instead of... uh, So we actually... twice as good. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit lower than what John Tour thought. Um, but that episode is available. It would be episode 23 if you want to go check it out. Has been. Um, and it is the better movie in pretty much every regard compared to Broadway Melody. Yeah. I think what we should do, Timo, you say it's available and that goes without saying, but I think we should, I think we should have a Quest Disney Vault where we oh, arbitrarily delist certain Quest episodes and bring them back to generate mm-hmm. hype. I think out we start with Out of this Africa. This year. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> who's watching strategy. Out of Africa? No one. But... Once they realize it's gone, they'll they will, really want to watch it. They will and want so to watch it. so when we eventually re-release it, just thousands of views. They'll just come flooding in. You know, I think I think Robert Redford and Meryl Streep really need that boost to their careers. Mm-hmm. I truly really think mm-hmm. so. They're both hurting, yeah. Yeah. No, they're both very popular. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I got that mistaken. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk let's, about Mrs. Miniver. Let's because, talk about Mrs. Miniver. Tenor, because? Because I really like this movie. I thought this is a very, very good film. Uh, I enjoyed it through and through. I think it's very strong in a lot of aspects, performance-wise. Uh, you know, we, we like to talk about movies. You know, we, we look at them through a 2021 lens. But I think this film is so intrinsic and ingrained in every fiber of its being with that sort of, like, early World War II sort of rallying against uh, rallying against the Krauts, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's very... I think it's very heartfelt. I think it's very hopeful. And uh, I think it's just kind of like inspiring all these, you know, what is it? Uh, I can do quick math here. It's, uh, 80 years later. Is that about it? Yeah, it's yeah. very close. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. So close. I really enjoyed this and I can't wait to talk about more, talk about it more. There you go. Tanner or, or Abram. You look like you've got well, some yeah. thoughts. Breathing a little bit. 
Well, well, I think it's good you felt that way, Tanner, because this is a propaganda film, so it seems like it did its job oh. all these decades later. Um, I, I really like Miss Miniver. I think of the three Wyler movies we've watched, this is probably my favorite. Hmm. But also, like all of his movies, I think it's about 30 minutes too long, and I want to talk hmm. about that pacing a little bit. However, when I finish the film, especially in that final speech in the bombed-out church... I was like, this is this is a very motivating way to end the film, but a very particular warmongering motivation. And so I did a little, mm. little bit of reading into the film and mm-hmm. and came across its um its importance towards getting yes. the uh, the American populace invested in the war effort of which we had just joined uh, months before the release of the film. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it. From from that lens, through that context, is a very interesting film. Perhaps one of the most deliberate films we've watched. And I think yep. the fact that it's able to operate, I think, pretty well outside of the context of its propagandistic elements is very impressive. But the ways that that weaves throughout the film is also very interesting. How that kind of tracks today is something to discuss, but I think in the context of when it released, that is such an important dimension of what what of what Miss Miniver is. Sure, indeed, indeed. Tucker, you have any have any have any initial thoughts on this film? My my initial thoughts are kind of going to lead into everything else that I have to say on this film, which is I frankly don't have a ton of thoughts on it. I think it's totally serviceable in every element, but I don't necessarily think it stands out in any particular way. And frankly. Yeah, we watched it two days ago. I'm already struggling to remember most of it. When you say that ending speech, I'm like, oh, wait, was there an ending speech? Okay, oh, there, <laughs> oh yeah, was there a was a sizable one. <laughs> and so, like, I'm picking it up as I'm remembering, but I think that, to me, just proves that I, I kind of see this film as of its era in a way that kind of makes it nondescript. Mm. Uh, I've seen a lot of movies like this. I've heard these kind of uh, of-the-era um, themes and messages and acting and uh styles of character writing that are just supposed to represent you know the white middle class who this is clearly angled towards like it was kind of all just on the bar for me but i think it's historical importance as you were saying makes it interesting from that angle but as i was watching this i didn't have a ton to grab onto and while i don't necessarily have any ma- major complaints with it um it, it really doesn't stick out to me in any particular way mm. mm-hmm yeah. Well, for me, I found this film very endearing, uh, I, I pretty much enjoyable all the way through. I agree with Abram a little bit on the pacing. I think we'll get into that. Um, but I think that the the whole history of the film and the, con- the context that it sits in within World War II is like super, super interesting. I will admit I've been on a bit of a World War II bender recently. I've been writing essays about it and watching other other films that feature World War II. And so just to get this other element, um, this film is so pointed in its purpose of what it's trying to do. It's propaganda and it doesn't really try to be anything else. But I think that you can also nowadays, I am still able to read the film as just a film and not necessarily as like, you know, what is this driving us to do? And I, you know, I read that the art of Abram sent over a BBC article last night and I read through it, found it super mm. interesting, which will possibly be linked in the description for your. Oh, sure. Yeah. Why not? Pleasure. You yeah. know what? Why not? It's great. We context have that ability, the guys. I, I like that. I like that. We're helping out. We're helping out all the people in need. Robert Redford, Meryl Streep, the BBC, all these yeah. struggling sort yes. of uh, entities. Uh, but I will say. Um, I, I don't disagree that this isn't that this is a uh, a war propaganda film, but I'll, I'm on board with anti-Nazi propaganda. I'm on board with that. I don't care. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, that's maybe uh, this is the film of, that really that's some of the that's finally some of the, tipped me into that camp. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it put the, the nail in the coffin for Tanner on his opinion on the Nazis. No, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been against Nazis since about I learned since about when I learned what they were. And, uh, you know, anti-Nazi propaganda, probably about one of the best types of propaganda, you know? Yeah, and this film is particularly effective in that um, there's a a good number of scenes where, oh, it just makes my blood boil. I'm like, ah. I go, ah, I hate, I really hate the Nazis right now while I'm watching the movie. And, you know, so that props to old Weiler because that was totally what he was trying to do. And it worked. Those, Those Nazis and their sweat stickers, you know? Those darn sweat stickers. Ah, the darn Jerry's. Well, yeah. what, um, I don't know, where do, what, what do, where do we go from here? 
let's I kind of want to talk about the about the characters and the acting sure. because I found the romance in this film to be particularly palpable. I really, really enjoyed Vin and Carol's romance together. I thought that the two actors had great chemistry on screen. When I yeah. saw them interact for the first time, I was like, like you're supposed to know. Like, oh yeah, they're totally in love. But it, it, before the film like really told you that very explicitly, I was like, oh yeah, these two are going to get together. And I found that their arc was fairly satisfying. And as romances go, nice and heartfelt, sad in the end, but sad yeah. in a way that I wasn't expecting. I Maybe no, I wasn't thinking very no, hard about it, but it, the, the, the twist with their romance uh, is particularly like not, I don't know, it, it's not predictable. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, I I I, I totally agree. I think that the two of them, their characters and their relationship is the highlight of this movie by far. Um I, both Vin and Carol are feel very like very unique characters in comparison to I would say everyone else feeling pretty particular niches, but Vin kind of being this uh liberal guy who's really into intellectualism and all that stuff. Those lines at the beginning are really, really funny. Oh, that, I it's felt, a surprising I'm, amount of, of satire on like this. I felt so uh, called out. But no action and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Teresa Wright's character, Carol, um, also being uh, upper class, but, you know, th- sort of thinking down to the level of the lower classes and being stuck in this family cycle and stuff like that. I think both of them are very compelling. And I, you're right. I think their romance is is probably the strongest aspect of this film because there are just some sequences like they are just they're just ready to jump each other's bones like there's there's no other way around this they they're gonna go straight where they need to yeah uh, but think, yeah no I definitely agree I think their dynamic you guys are right is very very good uh you know we talk about Vin you he, he comes home from college he's all oh, he's all grown up but he's he's been indoctrinated by those darn liberal colleges or whatever. Uh, you know, he's talking about, you know, the, the society that we really, that we live in isn't actually that far off from the feudal societies of medieval times. And everyone's like, all right, Vin. Okay, okay yeah, Vin, we get I'll... it. And then Carol shows up and she's really the only one that dishes it back to him because she, she's, you know, she's the granddaughter of Mrs. Belden, I believe yes. is the character's name. And uh, he's like, oh, you Beldons, you're the you're the bane of our existence. You know, you're like the feudal lords of our of our village or whatever. And she's like, well, I, I I like go places and like help out. You know, I do charity work and stuff like that. And she's like, what do you do? He's like, uh, I, I, uh, that's not a fair question Zoom. to ask. <laughs> yeah, zooms out and, of the room. And you know, we come around to the end of their arc when they've been married now. After Carol has said that she's come to terms with the fact that Vin might and probably won't make it out of the war, and she has come to terms with that. And then the flipping of that, where she is the one who gets taken out by you know, a, a crashing fighter plane. And uh, I think it's a really interesting way to flip it. It leaves it on an interesting note. Um, I do kind of wish vi- we got some Vin coming to terms with that and a little bit of more wrapping his character up uh, with her death. But yeah. that, that's, may- that's maybe one of the aspects of the where this film falls short for me. But for... 90% of that arc. It's super interesting, super endearing, and I like both of those actors and characters. I I think that their romance serves a really great dual purpose in the narrative. I, I think on, on the more plot level, it is really great. I find this movie to be really witty and really fun, mm-hmm. especially in that opening act. Not only the, the Oxford class stuff, which is really great, mm-hmm. but like the, the little kids talking about, I'm going through a phase and all of this. It, it, it is really, it's really fun. I don't know what you're doing. Oh, I'm just, go, I'm go just smiling because I'm go. thinking about the little kids. I want to yes, talk about them yes, later. But, 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 Abram, but, Abram, complete your statement. Yes, because you're, you're, making, you're making a face and it got yeah, me very sorry. curious. But okay. what, what I, where I was going with this is I think that this sort of wit and humor as it pertains to their relationship sets this great foundation for a romance that you care about. And then when it is pulled away, I think this is where Weiler is servicing the propaganda arm of this film mm, strongly. Sure. Because what's really subversive about this as a pro-war film is that it isn't glorifying the men going to war. It's Mm -hmm. glorifying the women staying at home. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that see action. Yeah, we, we, we the the the. Or they're Clem, the ones we see see action. Yeah, because Wait. Clem, the father, goes to Dunkirk, which he is does one of the, the plot most, of Dunkirk. <laughs> yes, which is one of the most heroic things to happen during World War Two. But mm-hmm. we don't see it. What we see is instead 
uh, Miss Miniver having to deal with a German soldier. It, it is not, it's not Vin who dies the hero's death. It's Carol, and because of that, I th- the, the, it, it motivates the people in the audience in 1943 mm-hmm. going, these are my heroes that I relate to, I fill these roles. But then it also right. fills the roles of the men, the, the Vins, the, the Clems, who say, I need to protect these women, too. It's certainly based in very normative gender ideas of the time, but mm-hmm. I think through that lens, it's very effective in how it flips the narrative to again, motivate its audience and why I think this film is incredibly pointed and deliberate in the thematic mm-hmm. propaganda that it, that it is telling. So, and the, that thematic propaganda works not just in, in those elements, but there are just other scenes are sprinkled in throughout where just I'm, I just think about the, the harrowing scene in the bomb shelter where the, yes, the family, yes. where it's it's the, the Minivers, the children and the cat and they're sitting there and it's just like that set is just rocking all over the place. I mean, I felt the film, I felt a little distant from the film, mostly, I will say, while I was watching it. But man, that scene pulled me in. I was like, I was on the verge of tears when I was watching it because it was like super, super emotionally important. And and I just was thinking about, I was thinking about, you know, all the other war films we've seen. Um, and I'm like, oh, like, uh, ah, you know, just make me angry because, you know, with good reason. I was like, why these people mm-hmm. don't deserve this, but they are, they have to deal with it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of, you know, we talked about that bomb shelter scene. I think we should talk about Mrs. Miniver her, herself, Greer Garson, because I absolutely adored her in this film. I think she's, I think she knocks out of the park in uh, every single aspect. Uh, she's great in subtle moments, uh, and you know, she's good. She can, she can pull out those Oscar uh, real moments of, of the time as well. Um, if you're talking about the bomb shelter scene, the, the the where the whole thing's shaking or whatever before it really ramps up, and she's just trying to like stay calm and knit or whatever, but there is just like this this bodily tension like in her shoulders and in her movements that you're like she is freaking out on the inside, worried that they're going to die in an instant at any moment. But she's trying to remain calm to sort of keep up these appearances. Her husband is trying to do the same thing. They're 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 trying to remain or remain some sort of uh, idea of normalcy in their lives while they are in a bomb shelter outside of their home, hiding from attacking bombers. And um, I, if I could just bring up uh, some some great like subtle moments too, uh, there is a moment at the dinner table when their maid and her husband are sort of like having a send off. Her husband's going off to war. And uh, Vin has some smart ass comment where he says like, "Oh, something about the war is stupid." Or, I I I kind of forget the line, but Greer Garson has this sort of like, if you're not looking at her, you'll miss it because it's a wide shot of all the characters. But she gives she shoots him this look that is just so indicative of like she is embodying this character. She knows that she's not the focus of the camera at that time, but yet she is remaining in character and giving those little things that her character would do in that moment. And I think she just, she, she knocks it out of the park as Mrs. Miniver. Indeed. Indeed. I think it's a good time. Tenor, I have a question for you. Did she Yo. win? Um, did she get nominated and did she win Wins the award well, early today? You, you better believe she got nominated and won. Okay. Real yeah. Garson won best actress for this film. Uh, by the way, a little bit of Mrs. Miniver trivia, Mrs. Miniver, if you will. Oh, uh, <laughs> She gave the longest acceptance speech in Oscars history. Good uh, God, I, how long? That's got to uh, be pretty I, long. I think it was... Oh, I'm sorry. I lost it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Five and a half minutes. Except, excuse me. It was, she gave a five and a half minute acceptance speech at the Oscars, uh, which has later been exaggerated to where some sources now claim she spoke for 30 minutes or more, which is not true. She spoke for, she spoke for five and a half, but... There you go. Maybe. Other it. wins and noms or no? Other wins and noms. Uh, very obviously, this one Best Picture. It also won for Best Actress in a Supporting Role for Teresa Wright and uh, Best Director for William Wyler, Best Screenplay. Uh, it was. It also won Best Cinematography and was nominated for Best Actor in a Leading Role for, for Walter Pidgeon, Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Henry Travers, Best Actress in a Supporting Role by for Mae Witty, Best Sound, Best film editing and best special effects. So, so and Travers uh, was uh, was Mr. Ballard, by the way. Mm, okay, yeah, the station okay. manager, station yes. master. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, quite, there's a few interesting things about those wins and noms there. So this is the first film to ever uh, get eight nominations across the seven categories. That was being picture, director, actor, actress, supporting actor, actress, screenplay. Did I miss one? I think I might have. Uh, but anyway, it, it got it got double nominated for um, the supporting actress is the is the main thing, and that that goes back to what Abram was saying about this the focus of the film really being upon uh, the women who are you know at home and they they are they are seeing the action that the audience sees in this film. Also, William Wyler was not at the ceremony this year because he was deployed in World War II. Uh, his wife ex actually accepted the, the award for him. And uh, after his experiences in World War II, he admitted that he may have, uh, you know, been a bit too light on the events uh, of World War II in this film. But yeah, mm. he, he, he went over and was seeing action at the time that uh, he won Best Director for this film. As many other Hollywood professionals at the time did. Um, can't remember all of their names, but... You know, your big directors from that era were all fighting and what well, Jimmy Stewart was an air captain. He was flying the bombers and stuff. So they were it was a whole effort by the whole Hollywood industry to be in on the war. Um, let's I kind of want to talk about this film as like a warmongering film, because I remember there was a quote of about that in in the article that that William Wyler was like, yeah, I, I knew what I was doing. Um, and he was like, I I accept that that's what this film is. What do you guys think about that? It's interesting, I will say, uh, because, you know, l like I said, I think uh, uh, anti-Nazi propaganda is probably about the most acceptable form of propaganda that you can do. Um, but, I mean, I don't know, what, you know, what exactly did he mean by it being a warmongering film, just like rallying the, the people of uh, the allies yeah. against the, against the yes. Axis? The, I mean, the goal of the film was to motivate a more unified uh, pro-allies, pro-war effort sentiment within America because we had just deployed at the time. And the article also talks about how a lot of Hollywood films were were very careful with how they depicted uh, anti-German sentiment in, in, sure, in sure. parallel film with the intention of making sure their films release in those European countries to to continue to get revenue. So yeah. it was a very deliberate political statement he was making. Yeah, I think that one of, you know, maybe the most powerful scene uh, that communicates that message is after uh, Mrs. Miniver captures the, the German pilot. And yes. and he he goes off on the rant. He says, "We will bomb your cities, and we will." Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of ham fisted, but it is. I think it's very effective in its like, oh yeah, well these guys are not given uh given the Brits any mercy, so we should not give them any mercy either. Yeah, yeah, no. I I agree, and I think this is where I come down on the film as propaganda because propaganda connotatively is almost one hundred percent of the time used negatively. And I, I think that even for people who are very anti-war, World War II was an exception to, mm -hmm. to that political philosophy, for the most part, for a lot of people. There's still conscientious yeah. objection and all of that, of course. There's nuance to that position. But mm -hmm. World War II was viewed pretty black and white, right? And yes. so this film is propaganda. It is heavy-fisted when the German pilot is talking about killing thousands of people in, in at Rotterdam in two hours or the speech at the end of the film. But that is what needed to happen at the time in, in, in this in Hollywood at this yes. scale. Yes. And, and so through that light, when you contextualize it historically, it makes perfect sense. And I think that it was, of course, the right political message to share. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a big difference between this film being "Quote unquote pro-war propaganda and something like, and I haven't seen this, so I'm just pulling it because it's one of the ones that is mentioned. An American sniper being considered pro-war sure. propaganda or something. Right. I think there's a many shades of contextual difference between between this and a lot of the military-funded or, or checked Hollywood pro-war film that releases mm -hmm. more contemporaneously. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think what I find most interesting about this is not that I have. Uh, any problem with it being intentionally propaganda, but that it is 
uh, pro-war propaganda um, in, in an interesting way, in a, in a ham-fisted way, but one that feels certainly of the time and shows the importance of what film as a medium can do to an audience if it is promoted properly. And I mm-hmm. do think that there was obviously a part of that being the Academy knew that this would have an impact if they gave it the Best Picture Award. And it probably was one of the most important uh, politically, but also socially influential films of that time. So Best Picture makes a lot of sense. But when we yep. look at what Best Picture has been elsewhere, I mean, this is certainly not the first war film that we've seen, but we watch Platoon and Deer Hunter and All Quiet on the Western Front and and even things like, like Lawrence of Arabia or English Patient or Out of Africa, which are, you know, more tangentially war films. Mm-hmm. Um those always talk about the pain that war causes people, the the dark side of it, what the trauma that um, soldiers go through. It's really showing it seriously. And of course, those are very real stories that I'm mm-hmm. glad are shown. But this was a, definitely a subversion of, of my expectations of what uh, the best picture winner would be in terms of talking about war. Um, yeah. And I don't necessarily think I prefer this kind of story, but I um, certainly respect it a lot for doing something different and just in general i think the reason that i find this film still compelling even though i didn't you know super gravitate towards it is the idea that it is really tangentially a war film this is uh at at home the entire time but showing the effects of the war at home the entire Mm -hmm. time there's not many scenes that go by without obviously someone mentioning the war or uh or someone being called off to do a duty or talking about, okay, Vin is, is out doing his thing or what are we going to do when he comes back or what are we going to do if this happens, preparing, doing all this stuff. And I think it that's a really interesting way to connect you to who I feel the Miniver family as a whole is not the most compelling group of characters. I think Greg Garson does a good job, but I don't really find her character personality-wise that interesting for the first half of the film. I don't think uh, Clem is that interesting. He's kind of just... You know, yeah, I, a, a, I agree with a you male there. character in yeah. that scenario. <laughs> um, but placing them as this middle class British stand in family uh, in the war scenario, that makes them interesting. And mm-hmm. so while I will remember this film, uh, no, I won't remember this film for character moments per se. I do like the idea of placing these stand in characters in this scenario and making it surprisingly easy for, you know, white middle class British American people to relate to the struggles that are happening and and watching them even treat it with, you know, a little bit of humor, I think also helps it be more palatable because when they're just like, yeah, our uh the the house is falling apart because it was literally bombed, but you know, if we sweep up a little bit it'll be okay. Like yeah. those sort of things make those moments hit even harder, I think, mm-hmm. as someone who who kind of prefers films to take uh even darker tones on a, on a lighter edge. That really helped me to it, it it didn't make the propaganda feel as straight on. It made it it made it feel a lot more palatable to me. Right. I think it works I, really well. I think the I think the point is that there there could have been a version of this film that is just a World War Two a World War Two newsreel. Hey, help out the help out your boys in blue or whatever. Not your boys. I don't know. Uh, but you An get, army you, you, green maybe. Army boys green. Army green. Pick up the aluminum cans and bring them to the scrap metal yard, Billy. That sort of thing. But there, yeah. th- this has the uh, the charisma, the performances, and the the character writing to back it up. You get someone talented on board, like William Wyler. You're gonna get a piece of art that also operates as you know war World War Two propaganda. Um, if I may throw in some more Mrs. Minova, I'm gonna keep pushing it. Uh, I'm gonna keep pushing it. I'm gonna keep pushing it. Uh, Winston Churchill said uh, he, he's a little guy he, he was sort of important during world war ii uh once said that this film had done more for the war effort than a flotilla of destroyers i don't know what a flotilla is but many sounds inappropriate not gonna lie it's it's like an arm it's like an armada <laughs> oh i see <clears throat> yeah. and uh, some, uh, some british crap <laughs> yeah something like boats. that uh let's see here well, uh, uh, Dor- in a similar line, the the Nazi propaganda minister yes. also said he, he saw this movie and he was like, "Oh, they've they've totally beat us at our own game." Yes. He, was he he was strangely in favor of this film just out he of its said, power? Yeah, you have the quote. Yeah, Joseph Goebbels uh, said this was how German movie producers he, he would show it to them, and this is and he said this is how you do it right. Apparently, so fascinating. That's really yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. a, a really a really not great compliment but does shine well on well, the film's yeah. ability to uh 
to convey to its message. To motivate its base, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I think that's, and, uh, that's what it is. I don't see that as an, an insult to this film or even a dark compliment because it came from a Nazi, but, like, I mean, Goebbels was still a military leader and capable mm-hmm. of understanding what propaganda does. And I think it that strange universality to the strength of its message is totally a compliment on on the strength of this film and its writing yeah. and its production and all that. Yeah. And uh, finally, if we can switch over to the American perspective here, the closing speech delivered by uh, the the pastor, whose the actor's name was Henry Wilcoxon, at the end of the film, was actually written by Wilcoxon and Weiler the night before it was filmed. Weiler had grown dissatisfied with the speech as it existed in the script already and convinced Wilcoxon to help him pr- improve it. The speech was then, after the movie came out, printed in magazines like Time and Look magazine, which I don't think exists anymore. It's it's Pre- Time, but more pictures. That's what. Look oh, okay, is. interesting. <laughs> President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered that the bro- that the speech be broadcast on Voice of America, which as I assume was a radio show of some sort, and it co- and copies of it were dropped over Europe as propaganda. So they airdropped copies of the speech, probably on the little uh, pamphlets. Yeah, the speech you is just now... dropped DVDs of Miss Vanover. Yeah. Oh, good idea, Tucker. Just dropping film reels on people's heads. I, you didn't hear what I said. I said I, You said DVDs, but it's also funny to imagine film reels falling down. You see. <laughs> uh, the, the speech is now known as the Wilcoxon speech, and it be obviously in tribute to the actor, Henry Wilcoxon. And uh, by the way, a great delivery of that. I mean, I don't think yeah. this would have ballooned out to the size that it did as literal pamphlets being dropped down on war-torn England had he not just really gave it 150% during that speech. It is, I, I have it in my notes, it's a very moving speech. And, you know, he, I, I don't think he ever brings up, like, specifically, like, the the Germans or who we're fighting against or whatever. It just, Lord, it's, it's platitudes you know more generally about this the fighting spirit of of the general public and what we have to do to rally together and fight back against the tyranny and stuff like that and i think it's that makes it more universal and probably more affecting today yeah Yeah. it's it's really good well to get back to some of the art i think what even improves the speech even more is where it takes place and the set design of this film yes. in that yes. that church that the way that that scene is constructed in the set is we're pulling back and the church looks fine it looks like it always has and then mm-hmm. the camera flips and you're like oh I, I, that's the outside the church is totally destroyed from mm-hmm. this other angle and then he's sitting on the makeshift pulpit and he's reading it um that i think adds to it so much because you're like well it, it kind of a large part of this film, in my mind, embodies the whole keep calm and carry on thing. And that yeah, speech true. really feel, fills that idea when he's still, you know, they're all still in church and they're all still there. Uh, and he he delivers a super rousing speech is just amplified by where it takes place. Also helps it a little bit that then the planes fly over and then the, the yeah, soundtrack just the blares. <laughs> yeah. Blares um, God Save the Queen. And you're like, mm-hmm. you're like, dang. It really, yeah, it really <laughs> I turned holds that her. home. I turned to Tucker and I said, oh, they're playing the Macho Man Randy Savage song over the end. <laughs> okay. It's time, it's time for me to criticize the film. Okay. Because, because, it, because it actually is kind of tan- tangential to this whole point. Because I think all of this stuff is great. Mm-hmm. What I'm a little bit shakier on is the class stuff here, which I think okay. really bogs down the pacing of the movie. Particularly, mm-hmm. I'm talking about the, the Rose Contest. Mm, okay. Now, the way I read the Rose Contest and a lot of the class stuff at the beginning about them buying the, the car they can't afford or even jabbing fun at the intellectualism of like leftism and feudalism and all this stuff mm-hmm. is that William Wyler is trying to condense class together so we are just British people against the against the axis powers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i i think that's the intention and i think that's what we're getting at when um mrs brenton is that her name belden belden, belden. belden. when mrs lady belden, belden when lady belden gives <laughs> the first prize to to the guy from the train station mm-hmm. it's the the higher class meeting the lower class in the middle and we're all coming together against the nazis and everything right so yeah i get what he's doing and i think it's a, a effective from that lens but i also think it's kind of boring this is where mm-hmm. for me yeah. the pacing issues came up because it just felt like we we were 
not quite spending enough time with these characters in the context of just regular, quote unquote, regular early wartime civilian life. It was mostly it was mostly the Minivers in the in the relationship between Vin and Carol, and I think that's where the film is at its strongest. When it tries to go out into the wider community a little bit, I understand the the rhetorical function of it, but I just don't think it's nearly as engaging. And that's where I think you could have taken a scalpel to the movie and made it shorter and stronger, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting that the Rose contest is kind of the strong, like the the B plot or C plot of the film, but it's like it's certainly very important because they. They, they're always bringing up that rose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, frankly, I don't really know, you know, how the time scale of all that works or anything. Like, it's not it's not the same rose that he did. That that rose is long dead. So he's yeah. got another rose from the same bush. Whatever, that, that was just me trying to figure it out as the movie was going on. Because I was like, wait, no, that, that rose is fucking dead by this point. <laughs> um, but, but I do agree that Lady Belden is a character that doesn't really have a satisfying arc. Because... Her arc is just that she's a, an uppity, high-class person, and then suddenly she likes Vin a lot because he's kind of quirky. Mrs. Uh, and, and gives I need, her a, a, I need a kiss from him. Uh, and <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really all we get from her. And then she's just like a part of the family. And I, I, I agree that there's obvious intent on how that is supposed to be read thematically. But I think the fact that y- it's not like a challenge to win her over or she's not still fighting back near the end. Like th- there is a little bit of there that I think could have been fleshed out to make that character, and also the inclusion of Be- Bellamy. What, what's his name? Uh, the Rose guy, Station Master. Yeah, he is gone for most of the film. He has one or two cameos almost, mm-hmm. um, but he, it's not as satisfying to have him as representation of the lower class, lower class win when you've only seen him twice throughout the film i think that if he had been slightly more involved it would have made that final sequence better um and and yeah i i do think that there's ways that that could have been improved without removing it because i do still think it's an interesting part to see the community coming together and have that thematic class difference you know Mm ham-fisted that it is come to, to come to a head um but i don't think either of those characters are written well enough or or given enough room to breathe to make that as satisfying as they wanted it to be. Frankly, I say make the movie 10 minutes longer, give each of those two characters five minutes of screen time, and that mm. really make that moment hit home. Uh, yeah. I, I, I tend to agree with Tucker there. You know, I mean, Mrs. Lady Belden is just given like a stern talking to by Mrs. Miniver. Yes. Or she's she, like, she really goes on. Yeah. How old were you when you got married, <laughs> huh? Well, she's like, oh, well, it was a different time, da 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 da, or whatever. Uh, and my husband went off to war. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, the include that the screen time of the station master, st- Tucker, can you get a name yep, check yep, on that yep. guy? Uh, he got, he won a thing, didn't he? Uh, yep. Henry Travers plays Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Okay. Yeah. I, I do agree that, you know, he, he, he does represent this, like, you know, the more working class he's, and he's just the is, wholesomest fella. On the He's just planet. a real wholesome fellow. He's like, ah, oh, Mrs. Miniver, I named I named a flower after you and stuff and whatnot. And it's a touching moment when he wins. And you, know, I I think um they try to give Lady Belden that sort of internal conflict a little bit when she stands up there for a, a very awkwardly very awkwardly long pause, and she's like. And you're like, holy shit, I see how this is exactly going to go from three miles away. The, the cogs are clinking and clanging, and there's steam coming out of her ears as she tries to utter the name of a poor person. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's a pretty good moment. I would love to see more characterization to make it yeah. even better. But, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with those criticisms. You all make very good points about the class, and, and my only thing to really add about it is that when I when I, I I watched the film simultaneously with my 1942 goggles and my 2021 goggles, and in 2021 mm-hmm. goggles, I am not sold that these people are middle class whatsoever. <laughs> the, the, the the Minivers, Miniver? yeah, yes, no, 100. percent I think yeah, that's yeah. also part of the reason that I found them to be a little uninteresting. Is they're like, like they're oh. like middle class because they can kind of almost not afford a car, but they totally but, can. Yeah, uh, but, and but then they're just buying fancy crap all the time. It's like well. See, well they only they, they only they ever, ever do that to be once. Sold. I don't know if they were ever supposed to be sold as middle class. I think they're all always supposed to be 
pretty wealthy, but in comparison to, like, Lady Belden, who's, like, this oligarch of the town, essentially, apparently. Sure, um, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't think... I mean, I, I think that, that... But they have, you know, extends people further. working for them. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. Like I said, I don't think they were ever, we were ever supposed to believe that Their they son's were going middle to class. Oxford. <laughs> right. Yeah, I <laughs> they mean... They can uh, afford fancy hats. <laughs> Mrs. Miniver's entire personality for, like, the first 20 minutes of this movie is, she's a mom who loves shopping. Oh, yeah. uh, and that just Women did be not shopping, click am I right? <laughs> Kima, what were you saying? The, I'm curious what you were going sorry. for. The, the other uh, element is that Mr. Ballard wasn't super convinced that he was lower class either. Um, yeah. And um. so so those all of those class differences were a little muddy for me. Um, and I because the film is pretty clear in what it's trying to do and what it's trying to say, like I got it, but I think it could deal with some some more separation between them all in terms of like, oh, like, oh okay, Ballard is lower class, and him winning um, the rose contest is them coming together to, mm-hmm. you know, to all to all in the for the common good of of Britannia, I guess. Um, and so, I don't know. A little bit more clarity in regards to what is exactly happening and who's who's where in the class structure of of the film. So, it's not like a huge point for me because I don't think it's. I think it is like a tertiary level like thematic idea. Um, but it's there, and I do agree with Abram that it being unclear adds too much to the runtime. I definitely thought to myself about two thirds of the way through the movie, I'm like, nah, are we getting close to the end? And I looked at the, I, I like really, really, really do not try to look at t- the timestamps while I watch movies. Mm-hmm. And then I, I looked at this one because I was just too curious, and I was like, oh, we have an hour left. Okay. Yeah, I did the exact <laughs> same thing. I paused it on the chair, like. Oh, we still have an hour left of this. <laughs> yeah. And and he was having a jolly old time, so I don't even think I was I was that. having a fine time. I was just like, huh, this is this is going on a bit. So I think shortening it to that hour forty five, hour and a half, um who who really can say what that would have changed in the film, but maybe maybe it would have made it better. The one thing okay. I would say about the class thing be as you said, being like a backgrounded thing is I don't also think that's super true because we also have the inclusion of that class struggle and coming togetherness in mm-hmm. the a plot of the film which is the romance between uh uh vin and carol but like it, they are of the different classes but it and that's barely where their matters. Starts and all that but it doesn't really matter in their i romance. know i know but like i think the family drama centers around that class enough with the their conflict mm. initially and um and mrs miniver's conflict with lady belden and all that like those mm-hmm. are throughout a- almost every character interaction in the film I, yeah. I, I have to say, though, I agree with Timo on that point because I don't think that William Wyler does a good enough job delineating class here because, sure. no, of course. as you guys are saying, the Minivers have a private staff that works at their home yes. and they have mm-hmm. a humongous house and all this, right? It really feels like the delineation he drew was between the uber-rich, the pretty wealthy, and then the people that do the min- the manual labor ringing a bell. And yeah. just because of that, <laughs> I don't really think the A-plot had enough nuance in how those sure. two no, families point. related class-wise. That's fair. Um, okay. I, I, we, we, we've been, I've been putting it off. I've been holding myself back for most of this. But it's time to talk about my least favorite member of the Miniver family, the, the Miniver clan. That is oh, Toby okay. fucking You're Miniver. wrong! You're wrong! He is the no, best member. Timo, Timo, you, Timo, you shut up. You shut up yeah, for a second. Sorry, okay. Timo. First time Toby came on screen. First time he held, First time he had a line. Okay. Uh, th- this is a true story. This is a real experience I had. Something at the base of my being, at the base of my skull, my monkey brain, maybe even lizard brain, going back that far, like sent a message down my spinal cord and my fins, my my fists clenched up because I'm like. I have to punch that kid in the face. I I have honestly, I don't know if I've ever had that sort of reaction before to anything in my life, but holy moly, is that kid the most irritating child, actor maybe ever, I've ever seen put to screen, TV or film. He is, he screeches his way through every single line. He's always looking up and he's his stupid gaps in his teeth. And he's always, he's always, they always give him some sort of like quippy little line where he's like, oh, wish your face, isn't it? Or whatever he says. I hated 
Toby, and they sideline him, cons or they, 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 they forefront him consistently and sideline Judy, who is much more palatable, is a better actress, and all around just more likable because she isn't Toby fucking Miniver. Oh, you're out of your fucking mind. You, I you think are the kids are great. I love Toby. Master Toby is hilarious to me. He's like he he's just part of why this movie's so endearing to me because I'm like I'm like this kid is always asking the exact wrong thing, like kids do. You know, he's like, oh, are you gonna marry her? And like, and, and you can see on Vin's face, he's like, he's like. Fuck! I did not want to be asked this question right now. And then, like, he's like, like he has those quips about. I, I, I found him. I found him super endearing, super enjoyable. I mean, maybe he's a little screechy, but he's also like a British, like six year old. So I'm, just, I kind of let yeah, that. I kind of let problem. that. And he has, he has <laughs> his also a British. He has his yep. cat. I love, I love the cat. And there's, Cat's there's fine. a couple, there's a couple Napoleon's great moments great, yeah. with, yeah. with Toby and Napoleon, especially in the, in the bunker scene. There's a couple insert shots of, of mm -hmm. him, like, and I'm like, I'm like. Good God! What would this scene do to a kid like? Well, or what would this experience do to a kid like Toby? So, mm -hmm. I couldn't disagree more, Tanner. Yeah, I just I because I think a he, yeah he's he's annoying, but I think it, annoying in an endearing way, as Timo said, and because I'm a fucking jaded idiot, I have to look at everything with its rhetorical function. Yeah. And I think that Toby suits a very particular function in the eyes of the audience. The, the, the relationship Toby has to the people around him is a sort of relationship that people need to join the war effort to protect. You have to protect your your to your Tobys and your Judys, right? And, and I think for me well, that that came a well. Let's just pro let's just protect well, our Judys, if I'm honest. Let's say, you should you should want to protect the Judys and your Tobys, I, I, but I, I, you know, hey, sure, I, think sure. I, said, I think I said Can't the Tucker all. like. I think I said the Tucker. I'm like, I hope the Germans specifically drop a targeted bomb right on Toby's oh, you're, head. You're so evil, Tanner. <laughs> he was he was really going ham on it, and I fall somewhere in the middle. I do think that Abram is right. There is a rhetorical intention for this sure, child, yeah, and sure. the intention of having a a kid who does not understand war, does not understand social norms, all that stuff, and sort of complicating the frankly very mature rest of the family. Um, I think that's all very needed. But I also don't think that this kid was the right kid to no. play that because, frankly, his his screechiness and the way he delivers some of these lines feel very scripted. And when he's like, "Are are you going to marry her?" Oh, sorry, like, it's it's super oh. forced, and like it really takes me out of that scene. Like, yeah, I know exactly what they're going for here. Like, I don't feel gravitated towards the conflict of this scene because this kid doesn't know how to act. He's he's young. Mm. I don't blame yeah. him for that. But I do think they could have casted someone who was less over the top he is mm. screechy he does have a very goblin-esque face he's, he's yes he has some bug eyes that, that yeah, guy has some bug i think eyes. the issue is he has very light eyes so like when he opens his eyes wide to do his cute little lines or whatever it's like these it's like burning demon goblin eyes and his his gap teeth and <laughs> And Tucker, uh, I don't think he, I don't think he gave his line reading justice. It's more like, a, "Are you going to marry her?" I think, but I like think that. he doesn't even have that strong of a British accent. I just want to say, but no, I no, think that not. he's a, he's a he's a bit character, and and the, his function is to make that bombing scene even more intense because this completely innocent kid is having his life ruined in a bunker. And I think that we have become conditioned to the notion that a child actor must act as though they are an adult in a child's body. I and disagree. So, I think there are good child actors who, there, who yeah. can act as children. Yeah, but, but it, it, children act like this. Children are loud. They're fucking annoying. They ask weird questions. And I think <laughs> that, the, that the archetype of a British child, a British innocent child, needed to be in this movie. And I think that's what he, he delivers. Yeah. Now... Could 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 he be a leading child actor if this was an if this was two hours and twelve minutes of Toby Miniver I would have killed myself, <laughs> no. but it's not two hours and twelve minutes of Toby Miniver. He's a he's a bit part, and I think he's a very important say, one. Uh, if I can retort, uh, Jude Hill in the movie Belfast, you know that obviously that's twenty twenty one, and there's more comprehensive child acting coaches and stuff like that now but he's a great example of a child who can act like a child in some scenes and be more mature in others and yes. not yes. be oh grating God. in the slightest I, I will also say i don't think this is a huge detriment to the film it's just a funny thing i wanted to bring up well here's the thing it was frankly it was a big detriment detriment to me watching oh this sure film okay. <laughs> because every time toby co on screen he would like audibly make some sort of noise and then mention god i hate toby so much yep yep 
Yep. I knew yep. something like this had to be coming when I mentioned that I like the I'm going through a phase thing at the beginning and Tam yeah. looks like I just I don't know took that Slept sword off the wall. I'm going through a phase. I'm going through a phase. That's another one of those really scripted moments that did not mm. hit the way they intended it to because he just he was just screeching through it. Oh my god. Uh, I have I have a few other notes I want to quickly run through and okay. you guys could comment on them if you'd like. I really like the camera work in that scene where uh, Mrs. Miniver and Carol are in the car and they're being, the dog fights going over going on over top of them. The camera is like pretty dynamic for a 1940s movie and it's pushing in on them. It's very um, very claustrophobic in how it presents that. It also um, does this reveal of panning up to the bullet holes in the fabric yes, of the top yes, of the car. That's great. That's, yeah. that's a great moment. Yeah, you know um, something's wrong, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I, I really know something's wrong now. Okay. I got one more positive and kind of a negative. One more positive. Uh, I love to see all the British guys just chumming around in the bar. They're drunk. They're get, they're waking up at 2 a.m. to go to a Dunkirk or whatever. I think it's all. I think it's really fun to see them all chumming around in there. Back and, in the uh, day, the boys were up at 2 a.m. to go to Dunkirk. Now we're just yeah. eating shredded cheese out of a bag on the kitchen floor. Yeah. We truly are the weakest generation or whatever people that's, say. That's a meme, Abram. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I presume that scene where the German soldier sort of forces Mrs. Miniver into her house and like is spilling milk all over himself and stuff like that. I, I, I presume that's supposed to be like the tense high point of the film. I think it kind of loses a lot of that tension. I don't really have a reason why. I just like I was just like, OK, this is kind of dragging on for a little bit longer than I had intent that I thought it would. And I I'm, I'm kind of losing interest, to be honest, even though this is like the most conflict we're going to get in this entire thing is Mrs. Miniver face to face with a German soldier. I'm like, eh, you know, so that could have been better. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you uh, on that scene. It's, it's slow in a weird way. It's a little right. difficult to like point out why it is, it is slow. I think there's kind of a lack of sound in the scene. There's it's, it's mm. very, very quiet scene. Um, I think that's intentional, but yeah, I don't know. I would definitely have to watch that scene again and really put on my film thinking hat to decide to, to, you know, pull apart exactly what is going on to make it be, yeah, not as tense as it feels like it should be. Like story-wise, I'm like, ah, ah, but then actually watching it, I'm like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the issue is in the back half of the sequence when I almost, as the scene was unfolding in Mrs. Miniver after the pilot passes out and she's like, I'm going to get, we're going to get you to a hospital where you're going to be safe and taken care of. I thought for a moment, the direction of the film was going more towards an anti-war kumbaya yeah. sort oh, of I see. thematic no, angle. Point. And so mm -hmm. I think that's for me why the tension was then defeated sure. because the film sets up a, the, the clear antagonist protagonist dichotomy between the allies and the axis. But that scene at the end almost kind of, blurs that line in a way that I felt was at odds with the rest of the film and its yeah. messaging. I think the problem is is the inclusion of what you're saying there, and I think that applies to both what Timo and Tanner were saying, is that it does drag. I think that if you don't return to that scenario and don't have her talk to him again and just have the cops show up, it gets rid of that problem of it kind of being confusing on which direction is is she going in her distrust of the of the uh, Germans versus, you know, her being a caring mother or something. There is a confusion there, and then the cops show up and they're like, take them here, ma'am, goodbye. Uh, and then they just You're going away for a off. long time, pal. <laughs> like, th there is a, a three-stage jump there because that is, I think, conceptually the most interesting and unique right. yeah. uh, scene in the film. Like, it, it's intended to be the highlight, and I do think for a lot of it, it is when she finds his body in mm -hmm. the yeah. in the dirt, and then she, he there's, puts there's her that, and pushes there's, her there's the shot where where his eye just goes dunk, and you're like oh, oh yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's very good o o opening up with it but then he's like i think it, i think timo you bring up a great point i don't think there's like a lot of scoring music under that sequence if any which is you know yeah, yeah. yeah. which is uh, you know, a little testament to how important that can be for your film yeah sometimes you just need to be told how to feel and that's really what score is good for mm -hmm. yeah speaking okay. of score yeah oh oh <laughs> nice one Let's uh let let's let's punch it in. I think I think we've had a good time talking about this film. Um, and while we do talk, I think while we while we pull up the stuff and I figure out what I'm gonna put in, um, <clears throat> just want to lay out that I think the filmmaking fundamentals of this film are just like totally there across the board. Yeah. Um, you know, Tucker mentioned some of the camera work. I think that the the moving dynamic camera work is 
present throughout the whole film. I think sound design is used pretty well, um, especially in the scenes where lots of stuff is happening and we and we don't know exactly what's going on. Um, I'm trying to figure out what number I'm going to put in. Uh, he's stalling, guy. everyone. He's Come stalling. On. Come on, just do it. <laughs> All right, it's number. ready. Three, two, one. Ooh. Okay. Whoa, very, very close. We're, we're quite close in our assessment yeah. of the film. The average number is 8.1. Um, and so that's going to put it right around Ben-Hur, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest Ooh. on our list. But before we figure out exactly where it goes, let's do the point breakdown. Starting from the top, Tanner and I both gave it an 8.4, followed by Abrams, 8.1, and then Tucker's 7.4. So I guess the people that hated and liked Toby the most are, uh, it's, it's fitting that we are tied because then it balances each other out. How about mm -hmm. I, Okay. I so. There we go. Now let's think about this versus okay. Ben-Hur, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest and the films on top, the film on top mm. of Ben-Hur is Spotlight at number 26 and below mm. One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest is number 29, Unforgiven. Mm. Any initial okay. thoughts about where it goes in that spread, Spot Tucker? Spotlight's really that high? Spotlight is at number 26, yes. Don't you? He's, don't he's you, being a guy. He's being a guy. Don't you? Don't you? No, uh, uh, my, you're poking a bear, Abram. You're poking a bear. My thought process is that it goes straight in the middle of Ben Hur and One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. I think this movie is very good, but I don't think it's as memorable or as impressive. Um, I think a lot of its its context comes from how it was used socially, but externally to that, I do think that there's a lot of elements that I can say this is just what I expect. From a from a wartime film from of this era of filmmaking, um, but Ben Hur exceeds a lot of that stuff and is genuinely one of the most impressive films that we've ever seen. Um, so I think because of that, I I saw it in the middle, and also my personal not quite love for One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest puts that below. I think I think that's mm. my mm. No, that's where I sit. I'm I sit in the exact same place. Tanner, what do you think? Um, I, I honestly, I would put it below both of them, quite honestly, mostly because I, I, re I really do like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And as much as I can, as much as I can, uh, praise Greer Garson, Jack Nicholson is Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's he, Nest. He's, he's definitely better than Greer Garson in this. Yeah. Oh, um, I just, I should, for me, I, I, just, I shouldn't it, have asked you, Tanner, because I was going to put it in the middle, but now I'm second oh, just guessing. Do it. Here's mm. what I'm gonna say. Let me let me perhaps end the deadlock ahead of time. Okay. Okay. I think one. I think that the, I think that this film on on a on a secondary level, on a thematic level, on on a rhetorical level, I think this film is a lot more nuanced and a lot smarter than One Flew Over the Cuckoo, Cuckoo's Nest. How dare is. you? How I dare you? That, frankly, <laughs> I think that the A plot. Oh, come if on, you know it's true. If you're going A plot to A plot, I think it's a lot closer. But I think one of my major contention with One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that it didn't go that deep. I, I think that it was a, a very clear al allegory for the the individual and the state. I think that there's a lot more happening on a script level here. And for me, mm -hmm. that makes it m the more impressive film of the two, if only narrowly. Okay, well, I will not make a deadlock, and I'll say that it should go in between the two of them. Sure. Um, and my reasoning kind of comes from the context. I think the, the context of this film is important, and I think it's really hard to like even divorce it from the context just watching it because you're like you're, you're it's it's so clearly what well, this is what it's trying to do um and so and i think that its place in history merits a little bit just beyond like it being a pretty darn good film it's like a super important film it, like y sure. you could make the argument that it, it could have the like large effects on world history not all the mm -hmm. time that we get to see films with that amount of sway over yeah. over historical elements so I will but also chariot scene and Ben Hur go vroom. Oh. So you know, yeah. One flew over. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Never won any wars. So take that one, Milos Forman. Well, to be fair, Tucker, I think that the bus scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest goes vroom. I think the, the chariot and the scene boat goes. Scene. The, the chariot scene goes clop. That's clop. a great point. It goes I click, click, clop, click, clop. Oh, I've been run over by a chariot. Ouch. <laughs> we have to re we have to dub that scene for for our own enjoyment. <laughs> Let's hit the spin wheel. Um, sure. Well, there we go. At place number 28, Mrs. Miniver, score of 8.1. Pretty good spot for it to go on the list. That's above halfway. So this film is sitting sitting high and dry. Good movie. Guys, we're, we're really getting up there. We're almost two-thirds of the way through this dumb Oof. quest. Yeah. Dumb. <laughs> Our mission. How dare you insult it, Tucker? Hey, hey, this is literally my idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is your baby. And, you know, I, maybe uh, you don't have to love your children, just like Toby Miniver. 
just like Toby Miniver. Let's spin that wheel, shall we? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Digital, real, wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Let's and not wheels, <laughs> wheels deal. <laughs> the wheels deal is number nine. You can see it. Ooh. I That's am curious. That's pretty one. recent, but we've had a lot of 2000s, so I don't mm. really know where it's going to end up. What decade? I'm guessing 90s. That's a pretty wide swath, though, Tucker. Yeah. I believe you I might have the answer. I think quite a few from the 90s. Well, if I'm, if I'm given the, my room to speak my piece, I will let you know that they were, we are watching as close to the 2000s as you can get in the year of 1999. The Phantom uh, Menace? Unfortunately not. No, that, I think that was the next year. Uh, read it out. Read it out. Directed by Sam Mendez and starring Kevin Spacey and Annette Benning, we are watching American Beauty. American Let's Beauty. Go. Mm-hmm. Let's go, baby. I very much enjoy the movie American Beauty, yes, and I've been very, I've been very excited to come around to it for Quest, and we are finally. I know like I nothing about Kev. this film. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> no, wait, hold on, wait, hold on. No, take it back. Yeah, well, we'll be, that's, no. a wa- for this that's a little joke. That's a little joke. We no. call that a joke in the industry. I have two things to say about this movie. First of all, I like Sam Mendes a lot. Yeah. This is the same Sam Mendes that did Bond, right? And Skyfall. 1917. Yes. 1917 yes. is whatever. Uh, Skyfall is where it's at. Here's the other okay. thing. I can get on board with yep, that. Me too. Here's, here's the other thing. This is not the horse one, right? That's Black Beauty. That's Black Beauty. This I one... Can, I can... <laughs> would you guys like... Wait, how, how many of us have seen American Beauty before? I have, two of us, I, I guess. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, then, I, I won't give any spoilers for the no, plot don't. of American Beauty, I guess. That would completely guess. ruin the movie for them. Yeah. I, I, would tell, I would tell you what it's about, but I won't. It's not a horse uh, girl I will movie. say... I will say... Not a horse this, no, don't watch this one. Don't watch this one with your parents, folks. That's okay. what I will say. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Well, we are going to talk about Sam Mendes as... Mendez as, as, as American Beauty from 1999. Yep. Next time on the quest for the bestest, I really, really enjoyed this discussion of Mrs. Miniver. Man, I quite, quite fruitful. We really turns out sometimes when we do a little research on a film, we know our stuff. So um, thank you for bringing that to the table. That big thanks to Abram for that article about the context of this film because I think yes. that is super, super important. Um, it will be linked. In, and thanks to the big British club. The big British club. Big, big, that's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll link that article down in the description if you want to check it out. It's nice and short. Until next time, when we talk about American Beauty, keep it cool, and uh, and don't let those Jerry's get to you. All right, we'll see you then. Peace. Go <laughs> thing. Little finger waggle. We could just, you want to just make up a comment? Yeah, I think so. Make up a comment. Make up a comment about Broadway Melody. Ah, this comes from mm, uh, mm. John Smith. <laughs> Comment from Darth uh, Mooglinator commented, quote unquote, why do you call him Moog? Nobody ever called him Moog. <laughs> Someone named Lil Jit replied, I do. <laughs> Who's Lil Jit? That's, That's my burner account. <laughs>